When my son went off to serve his country as a soldier in Iraq, I entered into what was probably the most extended time of intense prayer that I'd ever experienced. I prayed primarily that he would be a good soldier, exhibiting the characteristics that good soldiering demanded. Honor, courage, wisdom, tact, strength, uh, strength of faith in the God that wrote the story of his life before his birth the God who had already determined the day of his death. I prayed that God would protect them, and I prayed that God would give him success. It was interesting how God urged me to pray at different times, times when I wouldn't have expected it. And my son came home, injured, yeah, but better and stronger and a wiser man. Across the country, there were other parents, no doubt more righteous than myself, praying very similar prayers, but their sons and daughters did not come home. Or they did come home, but their injuries were debilitating in ways beyond recovery. A seven-year-old boy curled up in his bed with a pillow wrapped around his ears listening to his parents fight in the next room. Horrible things are said, unimaginable things. And the little boy prays that God will make the fighting stop. In Sunday school, the lesson taught that Whatever we ask of God in Jesus' name and in accordance with his will will be granted. And so night after night, week after week, month after month, the little boy prays. And one day, dad moves out and never comes home again. Boys and girls, men and women, victims of brutish, Selfish, dishonest people pray for God to make the evil stop. And sometimes it does. And sometimes it does not. Skeptics say prayer makes no difference. It's a waste of time. If there is a God, his decisions are capricious or inconsistent and without thought or reason. People of faith say everything happens for a reason and his ways are higher than our ways and all things do work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And we continue to pray, stop the bloodletting Stop the wars. Stop the injustice. Bring the rain. Let the crops grow. Provide employment. Keep us safe. Heal us from disease. And sometimes he does. And other times he does not. It interests me that in a world where people choose disobedience against God, we plead for God to negate the consequences of our disobedience. In a world that we have made full of danger, we ask God to keep everyone safe. And in a world where... (laughs) We have made rife with disease. We ask God to spare everyone from illness. I read this week that there are some 660 different prayers recorded in the Bible. And as we read them, we discover that some are granted as prayed 
and others are not. God granted Paul's release from jail in Ephesus, but he did not take away the thorn in his flesh. God granted many of Jesus' prayer, but not the prayer when Jesus pleaded for the cup to be taken away from him. Nor the prayer in John 17. One might argue that uh, he prayed that his disciples would love one another so that the world would know of the Father's love and that Jesus was sent by the Father. Critical things for the world to know. And the church soon splintered. And it is estimated that today there are more than 34,000 different groups of self-governing Christians in the world. (laughs) I guess we could easily say from looking around us that Jesus answered that in part, but certainly not the whole. We probably all know people who have given up on God because they've drawn the conclusion that God has given up on them because their prayers were not answered in the manner in which they were prayed. These are the hard issues of our faith. And it will be the lessons of faith that will eventually save us. When God answers our prayers in the manner that we expect, we tend to begin to trust him. The more often he capitulates to our bidding, the more we trust him and our faith in him grows. But is it really a faith in the one true God or one that we have created in our own minds? The heavenly sugar daddy. Is that the way it's supposed to work? Is this what Jesus taught? Remember what he told Thomas when Jesus appeared to his disciples in a closed room after the, after the resurrection? Let me read it for you. Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came initially. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side... I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside that room again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put, your, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That chapter ends by saying, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Why should we believe in a God who doesn't answer all of our prayers, even when we pray for good things in his name? It seems to me from reading this account concerning Thomas's relationship with the Lord, that Jesus is telling us that I have given you plenty of reasons to believe in me. Stop looking for reasons to disbelieve. Plenty of evidences of my love for you have been witnessed and recorded for your sake so that you will believe and that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by Believing you will have life in my name. Prayer should enhance and increase our faith, not cause us to doubt. Prayer is far more than verbalizing our wish list. Prayer helps us acknowledge God's presence 
as we worship him. Prayer helps us cultivate our relationship with him as we spend time in conversation with him. And the more we come to know him and the closer we draw to them, him and understand his magnificence and glory, the more we will trust him to answer our prayers in a way that will glorify him and not us. Jesus' disciples recognized Jesus' relationship with God and it affected his prayer life. And they asked him to teach them to pray. And over the next several weeks, we're going to study Jesus' teaching about prayer in an effort to learn how to pray in good and healthy and faith-building ways. So if you want to join me in Matthew chapter 6, there are two accounts of Jesus' teaching. And this is the most comprehensive account. No doubt Jesus taught this lesson a number of times. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 5 through probably 15, maybe just 13. And let's read this together. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they have to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who, live, who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So some initial cautions about prayer. The first one is found in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For, when, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Like it renders your prayers null and void. And then verses 5 and 6 says that when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What we learn here is prayer in one sense, is a matter of integrity. Like a hypocrite versus an honest man or woman. Feigning humility while publicly praying in order to make oneself appear to be righteous is hypocritically ugly. Feigning humility. Praying for God's forgiveness. Go down to verses 14 and 15. While refusing to forgive others, too, is hypocritically ugly. Prayer is not only a matter of integrity, it's a matter of your motive. We'll say the glorification of self versus the glorification of God. Why are you praying? Why we pray matters. Praying can be selfish or selfless. Praying can be done for the sake of your reputation or the praying can be done for the sake of God's reputation. 
Prayer is not only a matter of integrity and motive, it's also a matter of audience in public versus in private or in secret. Prayers, and I've said this before, and it seems like no matter how much I say it, it doesn't seem to make much difference, even to some of our leaders in this church. But prayers are addressed to God. When we speak in prayer, we pray to God, not to the people who are hearing our voices. We don't pray to people, we pray to God. And I do get frustrated with Christian leaders who get up and pray publicly, and I realize they're not talking to God, they're making their point one last time with the people as they pray to God. This underscores, uh, this is underscored when Jesus admonishes private or secret prayer that no one but God will hear. No abuse of power, no manipulative ploys, just us and God. Now, lest you go here, this doesn't mean that one should never pray in public, okay? Because there are other examples of public prayers, okay? But this is addressing some of the problems with prayers that are prayed in public. And frankly, a lot of us need to find our prayer closets and spend more time in private prayer with God so that we don't have the pressure of worrying about what everybody is thinking about us when we pray. So that we talk with God and we're not distracted. The Lord's Prayer begins with our Father in heaven. Jesus tells us to address, listen, we're addressing the Lord of the heavens. We're addressing the God of the universe. He who is all power and might and honor and glory and strength and knowledge and wisdom and grace and love and justice. This is the God to whom we speak. He who was from the beginning and will be forevermore. That's our God. And Jesus tells that we tells us that we may address him as Father. <laughs> Think about that contrast. Father, (laughs) of the many, many titles of which God is worthy, the one we are to use is one that draws us close to him. If we didn't have a sense for God as Father before, this should change everything. Father is such a personal address. John 1.12 says, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. (laughs) That's amazing. This great, magnificent God of ours who exists from here on into infinity is our heavenly father. Not like he's even just a neighbor or a distant relative. We are given life by our Father and we are born of his spirit. God is not simply a force out there in the universe, nor is he a benevolent being who capriciously grants favor or disfavor. You see, fathers should be close to us. Fathers who do not want nor do they seek a close relationship to their children are men uh, who breed and propagate curses. That's not our God. Our God is the bringer of blessings, not curses. And if you had a father that did not seek a relationship with you, nor did he remain close to you, what you need to know that God is about breaking those curses. And God will break that curse if you draw close to him in faith and in love. The other thing that fathers do other than 
just <laughs> draw close to us is they love us. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God? And so we are. In Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Be imitators of God, therefore, therefore as dearly loved, what? Children. And you live a life of love, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And other things that fathers do is they discipline because they love. Hebrews 12, 6 says, for the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastises every son whom he receives. Fathers also care deeply about their children. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because, why? He cares for you. Fathers teach and they guide and they impart wisdom. Luke 11, starting at verse 11, says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? And if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And the gift of the Holy Spirit is what allows us to impart wisdom and to guide our own children. Now I know that father is an emotionally charged word for many people in the world today. 40% of the children in the United States these days are growing up without fathers in the homes. 40 some percent. So when I stand up here and say, you may address God as Father, that might not mean much to some people. And many who hear my voice don't care for the word Father because it stirs up feelings in them. And the feelings are myriad. Anger sometimes. For others, fear Others, hatred or disgust. Some just pity for the weakness of their father. And some just extreme apathy that they have embraced as a defense mechanism. Some fathers are mean. Some fathers are selfish. Some fathers are twisted and perverse. Some fathers are abusive. Some fathers humiliate. Some fathers are weak and incompetent. Some fathers are lazy and excel in slothfulness. And some fathers are simply pitiful and clownish. Those who grew up under the authority of such men may be tempted to transfer their feelings about their earthly fathers to God, their heavenly father. This would be a common temptation. But I would urge you, if this describes you, to form your opinions about God the Father as you would do any other person. Form your opinion about him based on his merits, not a perspective that has been warped within you as a result of the sins of other men and women. It is in our best interest to know God as he is and not as Satan wants us to perceive him. And since we have so great a heavenly father, let us embrace him as he is. I believe that people instinctively understand good fatherhood and bad fatherhood. 
Now, instincts, once pounded on, can change. I understand that. But most of us can instinctively identify a good dad. And God has placed these understandings in our hearts so that we can recognize and know him and so that we can recognize and know what he is not also. What a blessing to be able to pray to our perfect Father who is in heaven. Our Father whose name is to be hallowed. The name and personage of our Heavenly Father is holy. This is the part of the message where I lose people. I've never truly figured out why. Maybe it's because holiness is so far from us in our own everyday lives. But the fact that our God is perfectly holy without any defilement at all, pure, in everything he is, and everything he does, and everything he says. A perfection and a purity which is, in, which is of inestimable value, which makes him do our praise, and do our adoration, and do our obedience, and do our awe. Somebody told me how many, <laughs> don't ask me to tell you because I, I don't remember, but how many things defile a glass of water even after it's been run through the purifier <laughs> that we take into our bodies. It's amazing how many particulates of this and that. Because in this world, we don't see purity. We only see shades of purity. But we have God and we worship purity. And he calls us to purity and even makes purity possible, which is amazing. You know, in Psalm 99, the Psalm says, the Lord our God is holy. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake at our response to this great God. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all of the peoples. Let them praise your great and your awesome name. Holy is he. Holy is he. It's like I'm saying stuff that I can't even fully comprehend. What does perfect holiness look like and the closer I draw to him the better I see it no one else with whom we interact or even admire from afar is like our heavenly father the very thought of comparison with him and anyone else is silliness think about who our culture worships on this Super Bowl Sunday Actors, musicians, politicians, statesmen, world leaders, philosophers, educators, authors, scientists, inventors, world-class athletes. Well, you know, the truth is most of them wouldn't even give us the time of day if we met them on the street. Despite the fact that they are all terribly flawed themselves. Why is it that we can love and revere these people so much who have given us next to nothing and harbor so much anger and resentment or even apathy towards our God who has given us everything? Is Satan good at his craft? As we close, I want to read some verses about our Lord 
And I just want you to drink them in. 1 Samuel 2, 2, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. And I'm going to substitute like our Father. Psalm 86, 8, there is none like you amongst the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. Father. Jeremiah 10, 6, there is none like you, O Lord. You are great and your name is great in might. That's my dad. Jeremiah 10, 7, who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For amongst all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like my father. None like him. Revelation 4, 8. There were four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's our Father. That's who we address when we pray. Heaven knows him. Heaven reveres him. This Father of ours is no ordinary being. He is greater than anyone or anything that we could ever begin to possibly imagine. Treating him as commonplace is just unwise. A practice really rooted, I don't mean to be offensive here, it's just the truth. It's rooted in ignorance of him. <laughs> Who in his position of perfect power and holiness adopted us as his children. It's almost absurd that he would look at us, but he did. As our father, our prayers ought not view him as an accomplice to our work. No, he is our work and our prayer should reflect his omnipotent, not ours. And as we pray to our fathers, our prayers should not ask, how can God help me accomplish my will? <laughs> but rather, Father, how can I accomplish your will? Whatever you want, whenever you want it, however you want it, Lord, just bless me and let me be a part of it because it will be right. It will be perfect. It will be pure. It will be to the praise of his glorious grace. Amen? Stand with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, we stand before you a blessed people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and children of the God of the universe. Lord, help us to embrace these truths not just theoretically, not just temporarily, not just as a way to make us feel good about ourselves, but in a way, Lord, that changes the way we live, the way we think, the way we communicate with you and the way that we communicate with those around us. What a great God you are. We give you thanks. And even those words seem small, Father. We give you thanks for your good gifts. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our King, and our brother. Amen.